uh, seem to face in parish work, uh, Catholic schools, and that's how do we get parents and families um, more involved. And I like to use the word engagement versus involvement because I think it speaks of something much deeper than just showing up. It basically reinforces the catechetical mission, that of drawing people into a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, so as Debbie said, I um, would encourage you to, to type in any questions in the chat box um, as we go along or um, uh, ones that I could answer at the end of the session. So when we, f we look at um, ways to engage, I think the first place to start is to look at what's keeping people from being engaged. What are the obstacles uh, in the way that are uh, keeping perhaps parents um, not just away from the parish, but maybe alienated in some way or disinterested. And I like to look at these from both sides, bo uh, both from the side of the home, the obstacles on the, uh, within the family, perhaps, uh, and then the obstacles within the church. And it, as I said, it's an important first step to break down the barriers and also move past assumptions uh, about parents. And it also helps us recognize our limitations, because we can't do everything. So sometimes some obstacles just can't be overcome, uh, as well as looking at our potential to help engage families in the overall life of the parish, particularly the Eucharist, which is the heart of what we do as, as a community. So beginning with um, obstacles um, in the home, uh, one could certainly be um, what we used to term, I'm not sure we use it so much anymore, mixed marriages. That is, um, in families where there is a, you know, a mother and a father, two, two parents, uh, one may very well not be Catholic, or um, it could be that one is um, more in, involved with their faith and active, and the other isn't. And so there can be a very uneven participation level among parents in religious practice, and sometimes that creates real tension in the home. So that's, that's one obstacle. Uh, another is that there are a lot of complex relationships in family life today. Um, and that's probably always been true. But I think we're very aware of it um, as we look at the different makeup of families. Uh, I just think of one uh, complexity in families is the situation where there is um, uh, perhaps parents have remarried, and so they have children, you know, some custody arrangements where a child may be um, in another home one Sunday and back with the other parent, you know, either single parent or, or um, divorced, remarried, whatever that is. Um, and that can make it very difficult. Sometimes they just get so overloaded by that, they just drop out. Um, another possibility in this realm, too, is that there's just a complexity in family schedules. Um, parents may, you know, they're, they're involved in all sorts of things. Maybe both parents are working outside of the home. Uh, you know, they have a lot of different schedules going on uh, at the same time. Uh, I, I read an article not long ago about how young mothers are opting out of volunteer jobs across the board because their lives are just too demanding. So we have to be uh, aware of that, that that's uh, it's a complex sort of thing in families, and not assume that they, they don't come because they don't care. Another one is that uh, there can be alienation from the church um, through perhaps some kind of negative experience that happened to um, one or more of the, the parents, and they don't want anything to do with the church. Uh, perhaps there's issues you know, at the church level on, you know, on a broad spectrum or something that went on in the parish. And you know, we all know how those parish uh, battles can rage for a long time. And so whatever it is, um, people just feel like they, they don't even want to get there. They don't want to, they don't want to come. They're alienated. Uh, and linked to that could just be simple lack of interest. It's just not, not number one on the priority list or even number five. So um, how do we engage them through you know, invitational sort of approaches? And then the last one, and I think this kind of links to the, uh, this point I just made, is that there is a need for evangelization, perhaps due to stunted uh, or unformed or stilted growth in faith. 
so those are a few from the home. You might have others that you can think of. But uh, I would encourage you to look at uh, you know, the families in your parish and see your school and see uh, what other obstacles you find in the way of their engagement. And then looking at it from the side of the church. Um, certainly one issue is uninspired liturgies. Uh, you know, perhaps the homilies are rather boring or you know, it's not very stimulating or the music isn't very good. Um, that can be an obstacle. Uh, another is a lack of connection uh, that parents make, whether that's real or perceived, between um, the church and real life, so that they see that there's really no relevance to what they're dealing with and, and living with on a day-to-day -day basis. Another major obstacle, and I'm going to talk about this more in depth in a little bit, but that would be poor communication. Sometimes we think we're doing a great job. You know, we put in these great bulletin announcements, and then we wonder why people don't show up, uh, not realizing, you know, what if, if what if a quarter of the parish isn't even there on a Sunday that we have publicized something? So it, we may not have the best communication skills. Sometimes we have unrealistic expectations around parents. I I do travel quite a bit um, and speak to groups around the country. And um, I often hear uh, people say, well, you know, parents just don't have their priorities right. And uh, yes and no, maybe they don't. But it can also be that we hold up a lot of expectations around perhaps what they know, what they feel invited to, and um, even what they're interested in. So we have to look at that from our standpoint and say, are we being unrealistic in terms of the kind of commitment and engagement we would like to see from a parent? And then um, another would be a lack of strong community in a, in a parish. Um, that is one of the most engaging um, and inviting aspects of a parish is when there's a lot of nice uh, community and warmth of community. When that's lacking, it's a huge obstacle to engagement. Now, due to um, the time we have together, uh, we don't have a whole lot of time this afternoon. Uh, because I certainly could you know, spend a lot of time on each one of those. But I, I want to focus on two primary areas where I believe catechetical leaders, catechists, uh, pastoral ministers, uh, school teachers, and school administrators might be able to bridge the gap between the home and the parish. Uh, and in doing so, further engage parents in the life of the church. And these two ways are building community and strengthening domestic spirituality. We'll look at each one and how they fit into what you are already doing in catechesis or pastoral work or in your, in your schools and where you might strengthen your efforts. So first of all, looking at uh, building community. Step one in this is to, is to assess your parish. Uh, I would uh, invite you to kind of take a step or two back and ask yourself, if I was one of the parents in this parish or school um, who's not involved, would I want to attend whatever these events or experiences are? Would I want to be engaged with, with the parish or school? And um, you know, then ask why or why not? Uh, I think it's a, it's a good way to start looking you know, at past our assumptions around parish uh, parents and families. And then to start looking at how uh, you might rate your parish on some of these community issues. For example, how warm and welcoming is your parish community? When you come into uh, liturgy on Sunday, are, you know, are the people there to welcome you? Is, or is everybody standing around in the vestibule, perhaps, in their own little groups, and they don't pay any attention to you? Uh, another, is there a well-planned structure in your parish for integrating new households into the parish? Uh, if the only thing they get is uh, offertory envelopes, it doesn't speak well to um, being part of the community other than uh, just sending your check. Uh, assessing the size of your parish. Is it too big? Is it so big that it's hard to build community? Because every Sunday, there's hundreds and hundreds of people. And how do I even get to know somebody if I'm brand new? Uh, and on the other end of the spectrum, is it too small? I mean, maybe some parishes, and I've worked in a number of small parishes, 
that face another kind of problem with community, and that is smaller communities tend to, uh, people tend to band together. They've been there for a long time. Sometimes they're suspicious of newcomers. Uh, or they can just kind of ignore them. You know, they're in their own uh, little cliques or groups. So that can be a problem. Uh, another uh, aspect of assessing your parish is to take a look at um, the entryway into your church or perhaps into your school or to the parish hall when you're having an event. Uh, what first impression do you get when you come in? Is the first thing you see when you come into your parish that thermometer that stands up there and basically says, this is how much in debt we are? Um, I'm obviously not a fan of those. Uh, maybe it's a cluttered environment, you know, that it just looks like kind of chaos, and that speaks to chaos when there's a lot of clutter. Or um, is there a well-identified welcome table and materials that, that invite people to become engaged in the, in, in the parish, in the community? Are there helpful resources that help people understand what the ministries are, um, what the school is offering, who to talk to, that sort of thing? Um, are there people, and that's one of the most important, people to welcome you, people to say hello. And this is true whether it's walking into Mass, walking into a school, or walking into a parent meeting. Somebody should be there to say hello. Uh, another aspect of this assessment would be what kind of messages are conveyed, particularly to newcomers, um, uh, as well as to those people that just drop in. Is it glad you're here, or let's get this over with? Um, you know, here's your offertory envelope, or where have you been? We've missed you. Uh, those kind of messages get conveyed in a number of different ways, and that is very important to um, either building community or putting an obstacle up against it. And then lastly, I would say, what specific community building efforts do you see your parish or school making uh, towards family? That's a very important piece. Now, when I'm talking about this, I realize that building community at Mass is obviously well beyond the scope of a catechetical program or ministry alone. Uh, so I know that there's, you know, when I talked about those obstacles and I said, you know, just they sometimes help us understand our limitations. Uh, we do have to acknowledge, you know, I'm not going to do anything about the choir, for example, on Sunday. but. How might we build community within our catechetical programs uh, or our school programs in any kind of ways that we are reaching and touching parents? Uh, here's some ideas that I have, and I'm sure that you have some of your own. But the first is what uh, I would say is make every gathering count. Uh, look at, uh, you know, perhaps it's a parent meeting for sacramental preparation. Uh, when you're planning it, one of the things I think to really look at is where are the community building uh, components of this gathering? How are we making the time with our parents uh, worthwhile? Nobody has extra time to come into a chaotic, unplanned uh, meeting with very little to say to people. Uh, you know, if, if I walk in as a parent and I see the DRE still running around putting the chairs up or, or the, you know, whatever the AV equipment is and it isn't working right, and, uh, you know, I, just, I would just feel like this is a waste of my time. I'm not going to come back. Uh, so look at uh, parent meetings, sacramental preparation, catechetical kickoffs, all of these as opportunities to, uh, to bring parents together not only to learn about whatever it is you know, that you're offering, whether it's the sacramental preparation information or catechetical information, but also an opportunity for them to get to know one another and to feel that they are part of the community. Uh, I would say also utilizing small group sharing and other interactive processes uh, in these meetings that interest parents uh, you know, in, in topics that interest them is another great way to to involve them. Parents tend to feel very isolated and overwhelmed. Uh, they know, you know, through television and you know, all sorts of media, uh, you know, experiences of so many ways they can mess up their kids' lives. So any ways that we can offer them uh, support, encouragement, and helpful resources, they, they are very, very grateful for that. And these gatherings are an ideal place for that to, um, 
to be shared. The next piece um, goes back to that you know, earlier obstacle I mentioned. And, and this is communicate lavishly. Max Dupree, in his books that he's written for business leaders um, on effective leadership, stresses over and over the, the importance of communication. And this is actually his term, communicate lavishly. And I love it because it's such a great, um, uh, great way to put it. And when we're looking at communication, um, as in all good communication is two-way. So the first place we start is looking at uh, communication from the parish or school to the home. Um, a few years ago, I wrote a book on um, intergenerational catechesis for the National Conference of Catechetical Leadership. And in the process, I was asked to interview catechetical leaders around the country around different forms of intergenerational catechesis that they were using. And I talked to a few people who had switched over their, um, their regular, you know, kind of traditional, what we call traditional religious education programs to whole community catechesis programs. And every one of them told me that uh, it created huge problems in the beginning uh, because they hadn't communicated well enough. It was very, very interesting. And I do think that a lot of conflict uh, that happens in a parish mainly has to do with poor communication and education. Uh, parents are on uh, overload these days, so if we're changing times, if we're changing uh, the structure of a program, it really has to be, um, I think, you know, communicated well in advance and people have to be brought along uh, with the whole process. And that means using all sorts of techniques to publicize programs and changes besides the bulletin. Um, I worked once with a marketing expert in a parish when I was putting together um, a program for family um, spirituality. And uh, it was really a great exercise, if a little humbling, because she, um, the first thing she did was picked up the parish bulletin. And she said, Kathy, look at this bulletin. She said, if you threw this on a dining room table full of junk mail, it would just disappear. And uh, I was a little taken aback because we put a lot of work into our bulletin, but I, her point was well taken. Uh, with all the communications that uh, land in our mailboxes uh, day after day, the bulletin can be just one more thing that maybe gets looked at once and then tossed aside. So it's only one form of communication. Uh, sprucing up our efforts by using uh, various forms of communication, and I think certainly one of the most important right now uh, is social media. I think a lot of parishes are moving to that and understanding the value of something like Facebook um, to, uh, to help families um, you know, learn about different things that are going on in little um, soundbite kind of things, texting, email, that sort of thing. Now, you don't want to be harassing people, but I, I, I think it's, it's just very valuable to look at that. And, and look around your parish at people who are good at this. It's not to say you have to do all this, but there are people that thrive on this kind of stuff, and so they would be happy to probably pitch in and help build um, <clears throat> a good communication campaign with your parents. Another form of, cat of communication, which I think is incredibly important for catechists and Catholic school teachers, is for them to communicate to parents about their child. It is so important that they let them know um, that they enjoy having their child in the class, and um, you know, just it, opening up those lines of communication between them. Um, and so I encourage catechists to give um, parents specific feedback about their child as opposed to, oh, yeah, you've got a great kid. You know, that's, that's so generic. It could apply to anybody. Um, but something that really communicates to the parents, I care about your child, and when they're not, you know, he or she is not there, I really miss them. And I, I want to be, you know, in, in good communication with you about them. Another piece is to um, communicate good news. Communicate your accomplishments. Too often we uh, wait till we're in need of more volunteers, or, or we wait until we're in need of money. And we, so our communication is always uh, a lack of, as opposed to we are abundantly blessed. I was at a liturgy um, actually just last weekend in a parish where the pastor, uh, during the homily, um, 
stood up and he, he said, you know, he went into this wonderful uh, affirmation at the community. And he, he was talking about Holy Week. And he said, just, you know, all of this, you know, who knew? I mean, when he said, you know, that we would just have so much come together in such a beautiful way. And he, he singled out, you know, the work of the choir and the musicians and, the, you know, the people that, um, that switched the environment as, you know, as the Triduum moved forward. It was so uplifting. And as I sat there, I thought, this makes me feel like I want to belong to a community like this. Because what he was communicating was, we are vibrant, we are blessed you want to be part of this. And um, I think that's really important. Who wants to plug into a dying system? So uh, look at that. And that's a good thing for you, too, because it can, it can help you step back as leaders and say, yeah, yeah, some things are going really, really well, and I want other people to know about it. Uh, another form of communication is um, rather than complaining about those kids that, don't sh that just show up sporadically, communicate with them. Uh, I saw um, a wonderful little idea in the uh, publication uh, that Group Magazine puts out for youth ministers. And it was on, it was a little article about how to uh, engage kids that are, you know, just kind of those sporadic attendees. They come a few times and then they kind of drop off the, the map. And they had a, they had made actually a little postcard. And on the postcard they had a, a, a photo of this, of a kid on a, on a milk carton and it said missing underneath. And then the back of the postcard said, we've really missed you. We hope you'll come back to youth group. And it was a, it was a clever little um, you know, idea that I thought was, was very uh, intriguing. And you, know, you may not go that far. You know, that takes a little bit of uh, tech savvy to do that. But thinking of creative ways to communicate with, with kids and the families about, you know, we miss you. We hope you'll come back. Uh, is there anything we can do to facilitate your return? And then lastly, I would say, you know, one of the most important things in terms of communicating with parents is to offer support, affirmation, and encouragement, because they just don't get a whole lot of that these days. Then when you look at the other side of it, um, parents communicating with, with the uh, parish. Uh, do we ever ask parents for their wisdom and knowledge about their children, about ways they hand on their faith? Uh, I think that is just an incredibly affirming sort of thing. And when, you know, think about it in your in your own life. If somebody asks you for some advice or asks you for your uh, bit of expertise, you're much more willing to say, yeah, I want to be involved with this uh, because they value my ideas and my insights. Uh, so any ways that you can provide uh, venues for parents to share their ideas, uh, that's really important, as well as providing them resources that will help them make more concrete connections between uh, liturgical practice in the home, especially through this uh, celebration of the sacraments and the liturgical year. Um, also, I would say, uh, look at creating venues for parents to offer ideas and suggestions. Uh, we often, um, you know, want to know their you know, um, contact information, but do we share with them, you know, who do they contact if they have a question, if their child is going to be gone, you know, that sort of thing. So that um, they have a, you know, they have that communication stream coming back into the parish. Surveys, email, that sort of thing are a wonderful way to garner some kind of information from them. Um, I would also say dealing with issues parents care about. Um, uh, you know, it can be a very important way to do program planning. And uh, again, I, I, you know, refer to a, an experience that I had not long ago where I was working with a parish uh, around a family program. And they were trying to attract young, uh, young parents to, to a retreat day that they were having. And the, um, the organizer of the whole thing, the committee organizer, said, you know, at, posed a very good question. He said, what's the urgency? What's the hook? Um, you know, and that was just such a great question because it's like, what's going to hook these young parents? Uh, what are their issues? What are their concerns that we could build upon and perhaps build into our programming? Um, I would also say looking at processes in your programs and events that allow parents to share um, uh, 
their domestic spirituality? What can the parish or church learn from them? Um, pay attention to what they're consuming, what they're reading, watching on television or film. Um, I always like to look at the, um, you know, the top ten bestseller lists, uh, you know, the movies, the uh, Netflix rentals, whatever it is, because we learn a lot about family life and what is of interest to parents and families through those sort of things. And then lastly, um, one idea that I used a few years ago when I was in, in a parish when I was putting together the family program was putting together a family advisory board. Uh, they didn't have, you know, I had, what I did was I recruited a number of people with different family backgrounds. And there was a single parent on the committee uh, or the board. There was a, a parent of a, a child with special needs, had some physical handicaps. Uh, I had an older couple on the, the um, board, you know, a full nest family, so that we had this broad spectrum of people. And I convened them about once every uh, quarter, and we, I would just, um, just kind of, we would brainstorm ideas for programs. I would show them my um, publicity materials, ask them to give me feedback. And it was just such an incredibly valuable thing. I got so many ideas that I would not have gleaned on my own, just because it was a number, number of different people with different perspectives. So that's a lot about communication. Let's move on then to the next one. Uh, in terms of building community, I would say another thing, of course, is involving parents in uh, processes and programs. Uh, this is pretty much a no-brainer, but it's something to really emphasize again. Um, is that studies show that this is one of the most effective ways to engage parents in a parish or a school is through some kind of way that they can contribute through volunteering in some capacity. Uh, but, you know, and we all know that, but I think one of the things that has really shifted over the years is how we are doing this in a way that keeps current with family needs and realities. Uh, beginning at, you know, those of you who are in school or, or parish um, schools of religion uh, in particular, where we start in the fall and in the spring, we tend to, you know, throughout those calls at the beginning of the year, sign up to help, you know, and, um, and that's kind of it. And I think that's a passe approach to recruiting volunteers. Family calendars are just too fluid for that. So I would say when you're looking at your volunteer um, kind of spectrum and what you need to fill over the course of a year, think seasons or months instead of the entire year. Um, and look for ways to get people to dip their toe in the water rather than signing up for something for the whole year. Are there single event sort of things that people could volunteer for and then uh, get kind of a feel for how they do and how much they enjoy it. Um, I would also say when you're doing this and involving parents, look for ways to help them to get to know one another. Uh, I recall when I worked at a parish a few years ago, Pax Christi Parish in Littleton, Colorado, there was a young couple that started to come to our Saturday evening mass. And like so many of us, they sat in the same spot in the church every week. And um, when they uh, had a baby and they came for the baptismal preparation uh, program, they told me how uh, much it meant to them to sit in that one section of the church because they said they had formed kind of a little community in that little area of the church. With, they got to know couples uh, and you know individuals sitting around them. And they said that was something that really kept them engaged in in coming Sunday after Sunday. I was very taken with that. I thought it was a wonderful, uh, wonderful kind of insight. So often we depend on things like coffee and donuts to be our sole community builder. And I don't know about you, but I find coffee and donuts to be very daunting if I'm new to a community because you walk into the hall and people are all talking to people they know and they don't tend to turn around and greet the newcomers. So. Uh, looking at ways when, and you know, going back to that making every gathering count, um, looking at ways uh, particularly that are going to, uh, you know, invite new parents or uh, shy parents, you know, the quiet ones to come forward and um, uh, to meet and, and get to know each other. 
Uh, one way to do that, of course, is to invite the regulars, you know, those people that show up no matter what you do to partner with other parents. It's a wonderful way to build community in smaller settings. Um, and I also think it's, it's helpful when you're gathering families together uh, in some kind of group activity, uh, particularly in um, intergenerational gatherings, which I'll talk a little bit about later, um, to invite them to create something, to share something that, for the parish, and then to share that in some way with the larger community. It helps them see that they are making a contribution that matters. So let me just pause, catch my breath, take a little drink of water here, and ask you um, to think about any questions you have around building community or any comments that you may want to type into that chat box or jot down um, to ask a little bit later. And we'll move on to um, strengthening domestic spirituality. I was, um, I was at a parish, uh, another parish a few uh, months ago, helping out with a baptismal uh, program for infants and, and young children. It was actually kind of an uh, RCIA program for children. And there was a couple there who had been actually asked to come at the request of a pastor who, um, who told me that um, you know, the family were just coming back into the church and their children were going to be baptized. Uh, and the mother in particular had um, a lot of interest in developing some spirituality, but she was incredibly busy. Both she and her husband had um, not only had jobs outside of the home, but they were um, very stressful jobs. And then they had these three little girls who were just adorable, but just never stopped moving the whole time I was there. And since I'm a spiritual director, he had asked me to come. And just He said, I think you know, it would be so nice if you could just meet her and then perhaps set something up to uh, to talk to her at some point um, after this meeting. And when I, um, when I sat with her, I was just so aware in hearing her story about her job, uh, watching these little girls just, you know, flitting all over the place. And um, it struck me how parents today and families today seem to have no pauses in their family life. They are just on the go all the time. Parents are literally breathless. They're constantly under pressure to be perfect, to make sure their children are happy, to be involved in all sorts of things. And it can lead to tremendous anxiety. And this is something I see every time I direct a mother's retreat or a session for young moms, which is something um, I do on a regular basis. Um, they, may, yeah, they may put soccer ahead of math, but this may be because of the pressure they have to attend to what they think of their child's needs to be well-rounded or socially engaged. And they may very well find more community among soccer parents than they do at church, sad to say. Uh, but I think what's very true is we see all of their energy poured into their children, leaving them little time or energy for their own spiritual needs. So they may not come to Mass because they either don't recognize this need for spiritual sustenance or they just don't know where to find it. So that's why I think strengthening domestic spirituality is such an important way to engage parents. And again, I would say a starting point for this is assessing your parish's spiritual offerings. Think about a Sunday, you know, a typical Sunday in your parish community. Does coming to church feel more exhausting than restorative? Uh, I had an experience of going to a church um, to give a talk one Sunday during Lent a few years ago, and it was a large suburban parish, um, very active, very involved. But I tell you, the minute I walked in the door, it was just utter chaos. There were like six or seven things going on at the same time. Um, there were pancakes, somebody was doing a pancake breakfast, there was Boy Scouts were doing some kind of blessing, they had three or four um, uh, adult ed programs going on in addition to all the children's catechesis. It just felt chaotic and I thought, this is Lent, I don't know what they're doing during ordinary time. So I just think it's important to look at how spiritual does your liturgy feel. Uh, what sort of ways are we helping families learn how to pray together, for example? What sort of resources do we offer them to help them participate more fully in the liturgies and the cycle of the liturgical year? 
to make connections between sacred symbols and rituals in their homes. Um, this last point is a webinar that I did last time. And, um, Maybe Debbie can tell us later whether that is still available, but um, if you were interested in that, the recording of that uh, webinar about how to do that, how to make those connections. Um, and I would say looking at um, teachable moments, you know, do you, are you taking advantage of those things that are going on in your community that can help um, shore up spirituality in the home, something that's maybe happening locally that parents uh, could it, you know, be praying for or uh, involved in some kind of, um, you know, outreach or, or something that's going to, to engage them in, in the life of the community. So some of the ways to do this, I think, um, to particularly in the area of catechetical ministry um, and how we can contribute to domestic spirituality, one is through intergenerational events. Uh, over the past several years, I've watched a number of trends come and go in the church, and particularly in catechetical ministry. And we often go overboard with one and then let the whole thing uh, slide until the next one comes along. One of these has been variously labeled family religious education or lectionary basis cate based catechesis uh, and whole community catechesis. The, underlying premise for all of those is the same. It's involving the household together in some kind of event or gathering so that you have some kind of an intergenerational um, configuration. There's a strong emphasis on liturgical formation, which is one of the six tasks of catechesis, liturg liturgical education. And it puts adult learning as primary. Um, intergenerational events, I think, are such effective ways to strengthen domestic spirituality in different, in different ways. Uh, first of all, they can be used throughout the year um, in conjunction with grade level catechesis rather than replacing it. I don't think it has to be an either or. As a matter of fact, I think there are you know, really two different, um, two different processes altogether. Uh, grade level catechesis has such an important place in um, in peer relationships and peer learning uh, and you know, age-appropriate learning. But intergenerational catechesis are wonderful opportunities for evangelization, uh, for that liturgical formation that I mentioned earlier, for communal prayer, and for community building um, activities and, and exercises. These kind of events can draw people in who don't ordinarily attend mass or otherwise participate in a parish. A lot of times they'll come because their kids um, enjoy it, and you know they often follow the kids. Uh, it also is attractive because um, it may involve attending a single event rather than committing to a lengthy program, uh, and that makes it pretty non-threatening for some families that just again want to dip the toe in the water. They don't want to get overly involved. Uh, there's high energy activities and in good. Uh, intergenerational events, lots of colorful activities, lots of opportunities for interaction and getting to know one another, sharing meals, and um, and you know creating you know very creative prayer services. And all this is incredibly important because uh, with children you can't do long lengthy explanations, so it has to move along, and that makes them very attractive for. Um, for family sort of things. And when parents find their kids really get excited about it, then they're again, more likely to become engaged. Um, and then creating some kind of follow-up uh, resources, take-home resources, those are very important so that the, then the family can carry that into the home and thus you build domestic spirituality through that. These events provide a way for parents and families to be together with the larger, within the larger community while also experiencing some of the rich traditions of Christian practice and belief. Um, particularly those events that are tied to liturgical seasons. Uh, and I think those are some of the most popular, you know, the Advent event, the Lent event, um, for example. Um, and they educate through the activities. They educate through the prayers that are used, the input that's offered. Um, it's much more effective at times than offering parents a very formal class on something like everything about the Mass you should know. You know, I just think they're more likely to go to something in which they can get involved with it. And um, because it's intergenerational, uh, be sure to include grandparents. Um, 
they are incredibly important in the faith life of, of children and in, in passing on stories, for example, to their children. Um, children. I read a statistic not long ago that 40% of children's books are purchased by grandparents. And I just find that interesting, um, uh, you know, to, to take note of. Uh, so I would say, you know, grandparents are often the ones that are bringing children to church and passing along the faith. Uh, and I did get a question, are these PowerPoint notes going to be made available? And I will certainly uh, talk to Debbie about um, putting those, these up online so that you could um, access them to be sure. So thank you for that question. Um, the next one uh, piece of this dom uh, domestic spirituality is being sensitive to the realities of family life. I think we've long since passed that point of seeing the family as a traditional two-parent, never uh, remarried, you know, that stay-at-home unit. It was never really the norm, but we're really becoming much more aware of that, I think, in the past 20, 30 years. Um, and besides, you know, that family structure, we also have to be sensitive to things like ethnicity and culture, economics, education level, the demands of work, um, Special needs, I think that's a very important one. We have a lot of families who um, maybe they're not engaged because they are taking care of, of, of a child with special needs or uh, an aging parent. And so those are things that, you know, again, when we start looking at that, if that's an obstacle, how do we break that down and um, perhaps provide respite care so parents could be uh, become involved. Uh, other things, different religious understandings with, uh, within the home, which I mentioned earlier, and um, you know other factors um, such as are our programs snobbish sounding in their language, so they intimidate people. Uh, we tend to use a lot of churchy language that um, that might put people off, and so um, you know how do we make our our um, publicity? you know, our information, our, our communication, very warm, very inviting, and very engaging. Um, are programs prohibitive because they're expensive? Um, sometimes there's cultural limitations for parents where, um, you know, where their, their culture um, involves a celebration of a sacrament that means an outlay of money. Um, do people perceive our efforts as a waste of time, something that's in short supply? Uh, in most families these days, and I spoke about that in terms of meetings that aren't well run. Um, are there burdensome or unnecessary rules that outweigh common sense? Uh, one of the ones that I, you know, I, that comes to mind is that family with the third child going through first Eucharist preparation. Do they really need to attend the parent sessions? Again, if they've been through it twice, for example, or might they be called upon to mentor others rather than being treated like first timers? So those are just some areas that, you know, look at your families. If you have that family advisory board, again, that can really help shore up a sensitivity to the realities of family life. And then lastly, um, I think some of the most, you know, important ways to strengthen domestic spirituality, and they're not necessarily programs, but really providing good resources for parents and families. Uh, there's just uh, a great hunger, I think, for um, good resources. Uh, and whenever I do retreats um, or talks, it's very interesting to me. If I ever quote anything from a book, I'll generally have five people come up to me afterwards and ask me for the title. Uh, you know, even though we have so much information around us and so much um, available at our fingertips because of the web. Uh, people are looking for really good resources, and there's lots of wonderful ones for families. So, you know, if you have some kind of newsletter or a little web update, um, that you could send little ideas for parent spirituality, for family prayer, for ways to, um, to help children, you know, pray at mass, anything that's going to help families um, become more engaged with one another, with, um, more engaged with their um, family and liturgical life and with the sharing of faith. And parents also need reflective resources for themselves, particularly around the Sunday readings and liturgical seasons. And lots of these are available for, for free from um, uh, wonderful websites, not the least of which would be Sadlier. I would hope that if you haven't visited Sadlier's website, you'll go on and, and, um, and visit it, webelieveweb.com. 
because we have you know question of the week and a um, liturgical discussion you know for every Sunday. So they're wonderful resources that that are easy for parents and families to access. Um, access, sorry. And then there's great uh, websites like uh, one of my favorites is gratefulness.org. Um, Brother David Stendhal Roth, who um, you know, who has just dedicated his ministry to cultivating gratitude, and they're just beautiful prayers on that website, message boards that are inspirational and easy to navigate. And then look at your take home, uh, send home resources from your programs. Are they family friendly? We peruse those very carefully to make sure that they're going to speak to families in ways that are meaningful. So again, let's just um, pause, and I invite you to think about um, you know, any questions you might have around this area of strengthening domestic spirituality, uh, or jot down any thoughts that you have about ways that you're already doing this or ideas that this is generating. And then um, lastly, I just want to look very quickly at um, linking the church and the home. Uh, I think all of us are pretty familiar with the six tasks of catechesis as they are named in uh, the general directory for catechesis. Promoting knowledge of the faith, liturgical catechesis, moral formation, teaching to pray, education for community life, and missionary initiative. I have, um, over the years, I've kind of taken those six tasks and looked at how do those translate into what I call family-friendly language? How is it that families are actually doing those six tasks within the context of the home? Uh, when it comes to promoting knowledge of the faith, parents aren't sitting down and, you know, necessarily, I mean, unless they're homeschoolers, but um, they're not necessarily doing formal lessons, but rather sharing stories that have a lot to do with the sharing of our faith. Um, in terms of liturgical catechesis, families begin this. We first have our first experience of what you know, the basis of our sacrament and liturgical seasons are through the, the rituals and traditions that we celebrate in the home. Uh, we have strong moral um, code in our church. And um, parents start to plant the seeds for that when they teach their children right from wrong. Um, we have so many beautiful ways to pray in our church. And parents are the first models of prayer and um, teaching their children to pray. But they also need to cultivate a, their own uh, life of prayer as well. Um, and when it comes to educating for community life, um, the first form of community, Christian community, which is domestic church, um, begins in the home through the nurturing relations relationships that we um, develop. And then that missionary initiative of witnessing to our faith um, it starts first by serving one another in the home and then moving beyond it into the family. So any ways that you can find to identify and strengthen these links is a, a wonderful way to engage parents in a deeper appreciation for their faith and the importance of their role in handing it on to their children. So uh, to end, um, I just ask you, uh, what else would you like to know about engaging parents? in the life of the parish. And I'll turn this back over to Debbie. Well, thank you, Kathy. Uh, we have a number of questions. First of all, thank you. I, uh, at, at, at the last webinar, I, I mentioned Kathy's my Irma Bombeck for religion. I just really, uh, <laughs> really enjoy listening uh, to her ideas. It, it, it adds a lot more depth into, uh, in, into my life. But anyway, uh, aside from me, uh, we do have questions from the audience. Um, okay. You did mention the uh, PowerPoint outline. We'll make that available on Kathy's blog. We believe in share. There, um, there's a tab for resources, and we can um, perhaps, if you'd like, Kathy, we could post that uh, your PowerPoint notes um, or the slides on on that resources tab. Again, that would be we we believe in share dot com. Give us a couple days to get it posted up there. Sure. Um, yeah. The the uh, the next thing is to mention, and I'll uh, send this out on the chat button. Uh, Kathy mentioned her earlier um, webinar, and uh, we do have it on YouTube. So if you go to youtube.com, sadly or religion, um, you'll you'll find that earlier PowerPoint um, presentation on there. 
so that uh, that covers that. Now here's a question. Um, you mentioned giving parents specific feedback about their child. Can you elaborate on this? Uh, yeah, and I, I just kind of draw from an experience that I had um, when our son was in uh, middle school, and we um, uh, we got a call. I got a call one night from his math teacher, and it was he had been there for about a month, and um, he, you know, he said to me, you know, I'm Eric's math teacher, and I, you know, I, you know, my first thought was, oh my gosh, what did you do wrong? <laughs> Which I think is most parents, you know, question if they got a call from the school or catechist. And then he went on to tell me um, how much he enjoyed having him in his class and, you know, went on to say, you know, he's such a great, he asks such great questions, really in-depth questions, and he just seems to grasp how to solve problems. And, you know, he, what he did was he really gave me this idea. I thought, well, yeah, he's talking about my son. He's not just talking about every kid in the class. And it, it really meant that he had made this concerted effort to call up and talk to us about um, about our child. And then, you know, over the course of the next three weeks, we got calls from his uh, three others of his core teachers. And they all had the kind of the same thing. And it must have been something they had done with all the students' uh, parents. But it was very impressive. And I, um, I, I, with each one of them, they had said, name something specific about our son. And so I knew that that they had made, you know, this concerted effort to call us. And what it did for me was um, I wanted very much to be involved in the school after that because I felt they care about my, my child. So I, you know, therefore want to give what I can to them. So I, you know, I have um, talked to a lot of catechists and Catholic school teachers and told that story uh, numerous times and asked them, you know, is this a, a doable thing that you could make a commitment to calling um, the parents of all the kids in your class, so you have 20 kids, you know, maybe do uh, four or five a, a week, um, you know, it's a pretty doable thing. But if you do, um, say something specific about them. And that means you really have to pay attention to every child in your class to have something specific to say. But it, it just, I think it makes all the difference in the world. And it is, it's one of the things that can kickstart um, uh, some great involvement and engagement by parents. Um, in the in the school or the uh, catechetical program. Yeah, I, I, as a parent, I would just add. Oftentimes, when the teacher did that for when my uh, children were growing up, my kids were growing up, they mentioned something that I I either overlooked or didn't even know about my child. And, oh, you know, yeah. Well, I was kind of embarrassed about it, but but it was like, oh my gosh, that really is a talent or a skill. So it just um, mm -hmm. you know it it, it that was uh, you know that always a. a something great for myself. Um, here's one. Um, the challenge for me as a fourth and fifth grade catechist in regards to social media aspects is so many restrictions due to the protection of children. Um, this person wanted to have a website engaging parents with pictures and was told she couldn't. That That is true. There are a lot of restrictions online. Um, mm -hmm. The uh, USCCB on their website does have the regulations for uh, social media. You'll you'll find that posted there. Um, if I may also add, if any of you are on LinkedIn, or if you're not, maybe you want to join. There's a great group. It's called um, the Association of Catholics Exploring Social Media, and on there, it's it's a combination of uh, the uh, as best as I can tell, there's DREs as well as uh, diocesan. Um, folks uh, and then vendors you know or professionals uh, like like myself and others uh, that have discussions on trying different things uh, with with a parish with a, a school um, what's available what works what doesn't work and it's a it's a pretty good conversation um, Kathy do you have anything else to add to it regarding uh, trying to promote social media and following the restrictions that are there yeah, and I would say, you know, I guess when I was uh, mentioning that, I was thinking more in terms of the parents themselves as opposed to the children, you know, and I, I think you would, you know, want to be careful of posting anybody's picture or anything, but more to give them um, some resource ideas or if you're, you know, to use it to publicize your program. Um, you know, I look, I know of uh, one pastor um, uh, in Grand Junction, Colorado, and every time one of my blogs comes up, he um, 
he posts a like on it, and I think I'm assuming it goes out to all his parishioners, you know. So it's just kind of a link into, you know, and it's not just me, but he has a number of things that he's kind of monitoring, and it just kind of gives them some, um, uh, you know, some some information, and uh, you know, so you could use it to communicate uh, parent meetings and. Um, you know things that are that are going on, or websites, or whatever that you want to kind of highlight, and and steer them towards. And that was kind of what I was thinking about, more of a, a marketing publicity thing, um, that again could engage them into you know knowing what's going on in the in the parish or the school. Okay, I I hope we answered your question. If we didn't, just write write some more, and uh, we'll add to that conversation. Uh, in the meantime, I'll go to the next question. It says I don't quite understand what you meant by having groups create something for the parish during intergenerational events. Can you give an example of what you're talking about? Yes. Um, as Debbie mentioned, I write, uh, one of the things that I've written for Sadler is the Gather in My Name events, which are on the We Believe um, website. Um, and they're free. They're down, you know, you can just uh, download them, all the handouts. and the, But they're most of them are linked to a liturgical season. And so um, when I created them, I, I was thinking about how often we will gather families together for an event, say during Advent. And they come together and maybe have a prayer service. And then they make Advent wreaths and bring them home, and uh, which is fine. I, I don't have any problem with that, except that it's everybody doing something individual. And then they bring it home, and we never see it again. My um, my goal was to help them create something that they, you know, maybe they take something home from it, but that every one of the Gather in My Name events, they make something that stays in the parish. Uh, right now, I think the Easter event is still up. And so what the group does is they come together and they build an Easter garden. And, there's, and the Easter garden is based on the, the readings of the seven Sundays of the Easter season. And so each component, you know, on each, you know, so there's seven groups, and then each group creates something that they contribute to this garden. And the idea is that the garden could be kept in place, perhaps in a parish hall, uh, and all those instructions are online. Um, or you might take, if there were, you know, live plants or whatever, and take them and, and plant them out in your, you know, in, in the landscape around the um, around the church. The idea of it is that people see when they come back, oh yeah, we made that. We contributed something to the to the parish. And kids especially just love that. It's like putting um, sweat equity into into your church. And so I would look at what is it that you can do together that they are creating. Maybe it's a prayer, maybe it's a you know, it's some kind of a, a poster or a mural or something that they're making that you that they leave in the in the parish, and that is visible to them in some way uh, when they come back. Okay, so I, I hope that's clear. Okay, thank you. Um, let me see. I think this almost wraps up our questions. Does anyone else uh, before we end this? Um, I think that's it. I, I we we so appreciate your joining us. Uh, oh wait, here's I'm sorry. For Easter, I engaged. Let's see, Kim wrote. I'm sorry. Here we are. For Easter, I engaged with the craft of making a rosary out of Easter eggs, filling oh. each egg with a prayer from a family. Wow. The rosary How was placed wonderful. in front of the altar for Easter, for the Easter vigil, and stayed throughout the season. That's a wonderful idea. That's a wonderful idea. Absolutely. Well, and Jim, exactly. And just imagine there's families coming week after week and seeing that. That's just fabulous. Well, that's a really great idea. Um, yeah. The uh, d just out of curiosity, then uh, in seeing it, uh, do you op take a time then to have a parish prayer where you open up each of the eggs and go through the uh, individual prayers? I just wondered what the follow up was on that. Um, all right, folks. Uh, not not to keep you online much longer. We I, we just so appreciate your staying on and and uh, through this presentation and discussion, uh, you can continue to converse with Kathy on her uh, through her blog, uh, we believe and share dot com. Uh, love to have you join or uh, add comments to our Facebook page, uh, facebook dot com forward slash savvy religion, or. If neither of those work, you can email me. Uh, my name, again, uh, is uh, Debbie Matulowitz. My 
email address debbiemdebbiem at sadlier.com. Uh, I'd love to carry on any of these conversations and, and, uh, and uh, go forward with this. So, uh, so for now, I wish you a, a, a good evening, a, a, a pleasant time. Oh, and if by chance you're attending NCCL, the uh, convention uh, in another week and a half down in San Diego, we look forward to seeing you. I look forward to meeting you. Just Kathy and I will both be there, so please stop by our booth and, and uh, say hello. So uh, thank you, and uh, uh, good evening. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.